Joining me on the line now is executive producer and creator of Project Potemkin, Randy Landers is on the phone. Randy, thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you for having us. We appreciate the opportunity to promote our productions. Absolutely. Uh, I came across Project Potemkin, I think it was a few weeks ago on YouTube, and immediately uh, I was struck by a slight difference with the project in that it seems to be more geared towards vignettes and episodes. It's more of a TV series, isn't it? Yes, it is. We've decided that rather than try to go with a format that is trying to mimic 1960s television, we're kind of free-flowing. You'll notice that some of the episodes are as short as four minutes and as long as 33, or even we've got one in the works that might be 92 minutes. Right. Uh, of course, the vignettes that started off the, the series run are actually very comedic, and, and I did laugh when I saw the inclusion of, of Lieutenant Commander Shelton, I believe it is, who, who's quite a, a great comic relief character. And, and then as the series goes on, progressing towards a more serious tone, I, I did like the comedy element. Would you plan to maybe continue that as well as the series progresses? Yes, we're definitely interested in maintaining some com comedy. I mean, I, I, I believe, and I firmly believe that comedy is a part of everyday life. And for for a series to show our our heroes as they go throughout their everyday, they're going to have com comedy during their day. That there's going to be some comedic element that's going to be popping up, and we hope to continue those. But we also will have the occasional serious science fiction story as well. That's good to hear. I think a lot of times people say, well, Star Trek doesn't do comedy, but it's been proven so many times during the original series and, of course, onwards then to the next generation. Maybe a little bit less humour in that, but certainly comic relief characters, maybe like Neelix and Voyager, will be ones I'd mention. Uh, but it's certainly a good element, and I think, again, it's something that's quite different about this project. Of course, we start off with some great opening credits. The visual effects in this series are really outstanding I and mean, I have to congratulate you on those. I, I think our, and thank you for that, I think our special effects team, John Carlin, uh, Bill Walker, um, um, uh, Rick Fox, Megan Warmack, the, the whole special effects team, I'm not doing anyone any justice I'm sure, but they do a terrific job in making it look really realistic. Um, I, I've I've shared our production with a couple of the college students that are on our cast members, and they're just amazed and blown away by the, the special effects that John and William and uh, the rest of them do. It's just wonderful work. It's always the trickiest thing, isn't it, to be able to replicate visual effects. We're so used to seeing movie effects, and, and, and also the TV went very high quality, again, towards the later run of Enterprise and series like that. Uh, but the characters are, are very strong, they're very unique, and I also think they're, 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 quite, they're quite drawn well. I mean, you've got guys like Captain Gregory in there, who, again, I have to put over as being you know, a really great actor. Uh, again, just his first take, I think, I believe, in The Void. Uh, will he be a continuing character as the series goes on? Yes, in fact, Jeff um, Green, who plays Captain Gregory, is a drama professor at Georgia Southwestern University. And a number of our cast members are his students. And Jeff is just an absolute joy to work with. He's just very inspiring. He helps bring the best of all the characterizations of not just his character, but the other people, the other cast members, and he helps them develop their characters as well. And the, we also rely a lot on the, on the actors themselves to help formulate their characters. A lot of times I'll just simply have character one, character two, character three in the script and find out who's available. Then we bring them in and then they basically figure out what story, how the story is going to progress, how they're going to act themselves. There's not all that much direction going on because the characters are basically developed by the people who are playing them. 
it's always a, a great uh, hallmark of a production when you know the actors get that freedom to kind of express themselves mm -hmm. and, and to sort of make the characters their own and I think again that that explains it in a sense I mean it, it, it does show when you watch the, the series that you, you can feel that the, the kind of the characters they have their heart in playing them now can you tell me some of the other principles that that are going to be a, you know a part of the regular cast of Project Potemkin Okay, well, in addition to Jeff Green, who plays our Captain Gregory, we have two uh, young women, Blair Erskine, who played uh, the young Ensign uh, in, Ensign, um, in The Void, and she has only done in one episode. In addition to her, we have Hannah Ruiz, who does another science officer, and we've also got uh, Kristen Woods, who plays Ensign Tenoshi, in another upcoming episode. So the cast isn't always available. They're students for the most part and not always available for, you know, this weekend or that weekend or mm. this evening or that evening. So we pull from this pool of of cast members and bring them all in. William Walker is an engine chief engineer, but we also have Chris Coleman who plays an engineer. Uh, I've actually sat at the engineering station several times myself, <laughs> with my back with my back to the camera, but just to have somebody in there. Um, my my uh, wife has been very gracious to appear several times as a as a background science officer as well. In addition to that, we've got Stephanie Burke who plays communications. Um, um, we have um, Doug uh, Harper who plays. Our helmsman, uh, the the Mr. D Mike, Commander Mike Delaney, and uh, that joke um, you may have noticed in Doctor's orders about him being a heavy gravity planet and mm -hmm. being told to lose weight. Um, Doug took that to heart, and he's been losing weight. Lord, he <laughs> lost fifty pounds. Excellent, excellent. You're even heavier than an elf rigger was. I'm from Zarthab. I'm from Zarthab what? I'm from Zarthab Doctor. No, you don't. Only one doctor per conversation. What does Zarthab have to do with dieting? Zarthab. What is Zarthab? We also have Renda Carr who plays the medical officer from time to time. We have um, we've had a variety of people play helmsmen, including Jack Harper, Doug's son, playing a cadet. My son has played a um, helmsman from time to time as well. Um, security officers, science officers. Um, we've got Richard Thornton playing security. We've got um, Bill McKenzie playing another science officer, Lieutenant Callie. And like I said, this having this this large pool of actors to pull from gives us a nice tapestry. Um, the original series did that to some extent, especially in the first two seasons. You never knew who was going to be sitting at the helm or the navigation station. Mm, mm. It might it, it might be Sulu or it might be Mr. Painter or someone else. That's exactly it. There was always somebody new there and even those first few opening episodes, there was so much chop and change, wasn't there? And of course, this is just the beginning of a project that for, for yourselves, this could go on for quite a while. I mean, certainly from what I've seen so far, it looks that there's to be a, you know, so much mileage with these characters and the setting. You know, it feels a lot like the original series and also you kind of, if, you know, a bit of a look of the motion picture. I, I know it's set in the Orion universe. Can you tell us exactly what that is uh, for fans who maybe haven't heard of that? Sure. Back in uh, 1979, I created a fanzine, and we've been publishing Star Trek fanzines for years, since 1979. And, my gosh, we've published hundreds of fanzines. And one of the things that we did toward um, the middle of the eight, 1980s was we established an Orion universe that was consistent to itself. And we did that because Star Trek The Next Generation was coming out, and there was always, well, is this novel in your, or is this professionally professional novel part of your universe? Why didn't you do this? And I said, no, no, no. Our <laughs> stories are in our own little universe. And it's consistent to aired Star Trek, the original series and the original series movies, but 
it's not always consistent with, like, say, enterprise. Mm. But we're quite happy with it, and we've set Potemkin in that so that we can draw on that tapestry as well. It's nice to have a a background that's established instead of having to, cr- you know, create one. We're using, of course, the Star Trek universe, but we're using the stuff, the, the background material uh, from the Orion universe. In an upcoming episode, um, we in fact mentioned a planet created by Rick Indris from Orion Press of the planet Xantharis, and it's it it just works really nicely into it. Mm. So that if you're watching the episode and you hear Xantharis and you've read the the fan stories that are on our Orion Press website, then you say, "Oh, I know what that is." Mm-hmm. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. Captain, I'm detecting a vessel in our sector. A little early for our support ships. Scanner to maximum. Who's mucking about this sector? Sir, it's a Klingon battle cruiser. Klingon? In this sector? Main viewer! Starfleet Intelligence has reported an increased Klingon presence in this sector. Captain, I'm getting an odd reading. Elevated hull temperatures and hull pressures on their vessel. Sir, an unusual energy nimbus is developing around the Klingon battle cruiser. This Nimbus may be the very thing that destroyed the three ships we're searching for. Hail the Klingons. Warn them off. Aye, sir. Attention Klingon vessel. This is the Federation starship Potemkin. We have detected a navigation hazard in this vicinity. We advise that you withdraw from the area immediately. Too late. Captain. There is no reply from the Klingons, but they are sending a distress signal towards the nearest Klingon base. Good heavens. Okay, Project Potemkin is www.projectpotemkin.com. And I recommend you go there, and I recommend you you can follow the links from there to the YouTube. We're actually revamping the website this weekend, and we're going to be adding a YouTube links page so that you can go directly. You won't have to mess around with reading through the site if you want to just go directly there to the YouTube. It'll take you to our YouTube channel, and our YouTube channel, of course, is www.youtube.com stroke. Project Potemkin, but this way everybody will be able to click, read more about the characters and the actors, the scripts requirements that we're working on. You can even download the episodes if you'd like from our website. Yeah, I mean Star Trek Two. I'm hoping for it. Well, I call it Star Trek Two, but the next movie, it, it's got a big chance. I, I think to cement Star Trek's position once again as being that top mainstream franchise and. You know, I suppose my hope would be that someday it can feel like a real equal in terms of success to Star Wars because, as we know, Star Wars has been such a behemoth in terms of being successful at this point, hasn't it? And Star Wars is is truly enjoyable. It Mm. truly is. And I've always watched, I've watched every movie. I, I, I sadly must admit that I am one of the few people who actually likes Jar Jar Binks, (laughs) but... It's 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 an amazing little uh, it's an amazing franchise and it's an amazing story that they're telling. Um, in a lot of ways, I think it's that they've marketed that franchise better than the Paramount has ma- marketed Star Trek. Mm-hmm. It's true. I mean, it's just so enduringly successful, isn't it? Well, listen, Randy, it's been fantastic to speak with you. I want to thank you once again, and also to wish you and the cast and crew, everyone involved in Project Potemkin, the best of luck with it, and I really look forward to upcoming episodes. Can you just briefly tell me what is coming up, and is there a schedule for releases going forward now? 
Yes, let me tell you, we've got an episode where we've got 15 more panel animations to complete, and the uh, sound design and soundtrack by Steve Gallant, and then it'll be out. I, I'm hoping for the end of this month, but realistically, I'm not. I'm not promising it. That's one thing that I don't like to do is promise over promise mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not be able to deliver. After and uh, irony is this episode is called delivery. And right. it's more in the. It is not a humorous story. It's a Twilight Zone type story, and it only has two actors. Okay, that's that's some hints for people who are looking forward to the upcoming episodes. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to them myself, so I count myself a fan at this point, and I'm certainly going to have another look through the the Orion Press as well uh, going forward. So, listen, is there anything else you wanted to maybe let us know about other than that? I've been very thankful to have you on tonight. Well, it's been an absolute joy to speak with another fan, and and thank you so much for the interest in our productions, both Orion Press and Project Potemkin, and and we look forward to hearing from you again. And let us know; we want to know what people think, especially these this cast of college students um, and college graduates that are local actors. They like to hear the feedback you have to give, positive or negative. And if anyone has any comments that they'd like to make, we'd love to hear them.